All right. Well, good morning, church. How are we doing? Good, 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 good. Hey, grab a seat where you're at right now. My name's Derek, one of the pastors here at Church of the City, Spring Hill. You chose a great Sunday to be here today. Did you know that? You know what today is? Baptism Celebration Sunday. Yeah. I know some of you cheered pretty hard yesterday for Tennessee's victory. I think you can cheer even louder today, okay? Okay? And for the, I'm not going to say it. I'm going to say it. If you're an Auburn fan, we got some really good stuff to cheer for today, okay? All right. Just a couple of you there. Okay, good. Um, Today is a special day. You're going to see some people come forward into this tank right here, and they are going to symbolically connect with what Jesus Christ has done with them, done for them. Baptism is connecting them to what Jesus did for them. Jesus gave his life for us. He died, he was buried, and he resurrected. When they go into the water, they go under the water, they're connecting to what Jesus Christ did for them, the death and the burial. But the story doesn't end there. They come out of the water because Jesus resurrected. And so I think for that, we can make some noise, right? Amen? So for us as a church, I want you to know this baptism means it's an outward expression of an inward commitment to follow Jesus. So each one of these individuals right here has made a commitment to follow Jesus, the ways of Jesus. They're saying two things. Jesus, you're my Lord. I'm not leading my life anymore. You are. So if you're a follower of Jesus in this room, that's, that's what you declared. Jesus, you're Lord. Jesus, your Savior. You're my Savior. And to have a Savior, that means we need to be saved from something. And that's recognizing that we've fallen short. We have sinned. And Jesus is our Savior. And so that's beautiful, what they're, what they're connecting to. You're going to see some, some kiddos in a little bit get baptized. They've gone through a class with their parents. We believe the parents are the primary disciple of their children, not the church. So I've gone through that, and they're making this decision together. So we're going to celebrate that as well. So you guys ready for this? All right, let's get going. We got Jen Thompson, I think, to start. We got a couple people that are a fan of CR here. I'm excited about this. Yes. All right. I have a couple of questions for you today. Have you asked Jesus to come into your heart? Are you committed to living for him for the rest of your days? my privilege and my honor to baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Buried with Christ and raised in the Love it. All right. We got another one. Let's get up for Rachel making her way down here. Rachel. All right, Rachel, you ready for this? I have the same question for you. Have you asked Jesus to be your Lord and Savior? And will you follow him for all of your days? Beautiful. Well, it is my privilege today to baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. You're buried with Christ, raised to walk in new life with him. Congratulations. All right, we got Elijah next, I believe. Come on down, dude. You're going to mess up that hair, but it's totally worth it, I promise. And Darren, yeah, the family's going to be leading this one. So, uh, my boy Elijah, me and Ma don't always do things right, you know. And it was a miracle when he rescued us. But it's even a greater miracle that he would rescue the son of, a, of an evangelist. And I love you and we're so proud of you. Do you believe that Jesus Christ is your Lord and Savior? Have you turned from your sin? Will you follow him all your days? I know you will. <laughs> so it's my privilege. Make your way down. Come on in. Isn't this awesome? Woo! Baby girl, Emmanuel Mulligan. I 
I've never seen someone so happy to be baptized in all my life. <laughs> and uh, the words of the Lord spoken over you, he tells you who you are, and no one else gets to do that. And the promise that he made that you'd never have to do anything to make anybody love you is fulfilled today. Do you believe that Jesus is your Lord and your Savior? Do you love him? Are you going to follow him all your life? No. So, it's our privilege to baptize you. Benjamin next. We're going to give it up for Benjamin. All right. All right, Ben. Your mom and I are so proud that you have decided to publicly declare your commitment to Christ. So let me ask you this. Do you believe that Jesus died for you? And do you accept forgiveness that he's provided to you and you commit to leading leave it, living your life for him the rest of your life then based on your profession of faith I baptize you in the name of we baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit Savior. Okay. And he's still going to be your Lord and Savior tomorrow, the day after that, for the rest of your life. Okay. Um, it's great to hear. All right. I love you, baby girl. Um, I'm going to baptize you now in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. two questions for you. Have you made Jesus the Lord and Savior of your life? Will you follow him for all your days? Awesome. Well, your mom's here, but I'm going to dunk you. Last one, let's invite Ethan out. We're going to bring Ethan out for baptism. Would you please give it up for Ethan as he's making his way to the tank? All right. Ethan, we talked about this day a couple months ago. You remember that conversation? This dude was so excited. He didn't, he didn't want to wait. But he wanted to party with the whole group, so that's why he waited. And we're excited, man. We're excited to recognize that you are declaring your love for Jesus to the world. That's what you're doing right now. I love that. Ethan, two questions for you. Have you asked Jesus to be your Lord and your Savior? And will you follow him for all of your days? Ethan, it's our privilege today to baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, Spirit. You're buried with Christ and raised to walk a new life with Him. Congratulations, dude. Can we celebrate everyone? What Jesus is doing here. Would you please stand? Let's sing together.
He 
Father, we say thank you. We say thank you for your grace. We say thank you for your son, Jesus. We say thank you for the gift that it was this morning to see the life change proclaimed through baptism, Lord. What a gift that is. We say thank you for that. And Lord, as we sing that song, Amazing Grace, we, we just stop and we say thank you for the grace in our lives. For those who, of us who have received Jesus as Lord, as, as Savior, Lord, may we not forget the grace. As we try to follow you, as we seek to be led by your spirit, may we be reminded of that moment where we were lost and now we are found. Where we tasted that grace and we just wanted more and more of it. We stop right now and we say thank you for that. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, hey, before you grab a seat, would you do something for me? I want you to try to say hey to somebody next to you. So here's the question. Uh, actually, the statement. I want you to say hi to them. Tell them you love the flannel shirt that they have on today to celebrate fall. If they don't have one on, ask them where it is. Go for it. Well, I know today we might have a few guests with us because it is Baptism Celebration Sunday. We're glad you're here. If you are a guest, maybe this is your second, third, or tenth week with us, uh, we want you to know this is a place where you can belong and be a part of what God's doing here. One very simple way just to get connected, there's a card in the seat in front of you along with a pen, and it says, share with us. It also has a prayer request on the back side if you want to fill that up. Um, but fill that out, and then after service, our worship pastor, Nat, will be at our next steps table in the lobby. He'd love to give you a high five just to say hey to you and also give you a free gift just for being with us today. All right, I'd like to invite the worship host forward at this time as we prepare to receive our offering. And very simply for us as a church, we want you to, to, to know that this is an act of worship for us. Much like we sing a song like Amazing Grace, uh, this for us is an act of worship where we say, Lord, I trust you in this area of my life. I'm not going to hold on to this for myself. Um, this is yours. It all comes from you anyways, and I'm trusting you in this area. So I give back to you and ask that you would do far greater things with it than what I could do on my own. So let's pray over this offering right now. Father, thank you for providing. Thank you for um, all the provision in our life, the talents that are represented in this room, the jobs that are had because of those talents. We stop and we say thank you for those gifts because they come from you. We say thank you for the resources that we get to take part in and stewarding, Lord. Some of that is um, financial, and we say thank you for that. And, Lord, right now we give back to you as an act of worship. This is more about our hearts, Lord, than it is about what we give. And we ask for you to soften our hearts as we give back to you. Remind us that you uh, are good, that you love us, you're in control, and you will take this offering and you will do far greater things with it. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, as the worship host passed that, I also want to let you know you can do give a couple other ways as well. If you didn't come prepared, you can do that through the Church of the City app, which we highly recommend you download if you're interested in getting connected to all things Church of the City. And uh, you can do it online as well, churchofthecity.com. All right. Um, as the worship host passed that, I do have a couple things to share with you. One of them is something that happened to me this past week. Uh, how many of you are familiar with a little uh, car wash place called Sudsy's Car Wash right down the street? You guys know about that one? Pretty great. It's right, it's right next door to my favorite restaurant, a little place called Culver's. Culver's is what I call it. Church it up a little bit. But uh, so I, I pulled in to, uh, to get a car wash this past week. And uh, does anybody else get nervous when you're about to do that? Like, I got to make sure I get in this thing. They're going, they're going that way, then they're going that way. I'm like, I don't know what I'm doing. Come on. And I got so nervous because I saw somebody from church, and I always get excited, and I always wave like that when I see somebody from church, and so I did that. And I completely forgot to put my car in neutral, you guys. I almost shut that thing down for another year. You know what I'm saying? Like, I think I had a fire earlier. But uh, so I was, like, freaking out. And then the guy there, he's like, uh, uh, Derek, um, he, he didn't talk to me because my window was up, but he gave me, like, the evil eyes, like, what are you doing? Like, neutral, you know, and so I, and the funny thing is the guy that did it, he goes to our church, and so uh, it was funny, but anyways, I prayed for him afterwards, no, um, but, uh, but I, I had this moment where, like, it's so simple, all you have to do to know how to use the car wash 
is put your car in neutral, right? That's it. Get in the lines, go into neutral. I want to tell you what neutral looks like in the life of Church of the City Spring Hill. You want to know what it is? The most simple way for you to know how to engage in the life of this church, a little thing called intro to Church of the City, okay? If you're looking to get connected and to hear, is this my place, to hear the story and to find my place in the story, going into neutral is just very simply signing up for intro to COTC. Um, we will take care of the rest. Much like when you show up at the car wash, they take care of everything, right? They put the little plastic thing on your windshield wiper on the back, which I don't even know why they need that, but whatever. Um, what we do for you is we'll, we'll share the story. We'll help you find your place. We'll give you free food because we want you to be a part of it. Uh, we'll even provide child care if you're interested in that. All our ask for you to go into neutral on this would be just to sign up for us, and that would help us know who's going to be showing up. It's on the 28th, I believe, after this service. So sign up for that if you are interested. Second thing for you to be aware of going on in the life of our church, the same day that we have intro starting, uh, is also our Child Dedication Sunday. And so much like baptism, it's this symbol, it's an outward expression of an inward commitment to follow Jesus. Child Dedication, very simply, is for you as a parent, you are declaring to the Lord that you are going to raise your child in the ways of the Lord. And you need help doing that. (laughs) You're, you're, you're saying it in front of the church, and guess what, church? We're supposed to be there that Sunday as well. You know that? Because you are here to be that second or third voice speaking into the life of that child as they're raised in the ways of Jesus. And there's a season, I know, middle school and high school especially, where that third voice is so important, and those prayers of the church are so important. So this is, this is a sacred day in, our, in the life of our church. It's very special. It's very sacred for us. And um, I actually shared this before. We have a family in our church where I told them about this day for you to understand the weight of it. There's a family in our church, uh, Jerry and Eileen Combs. If you know them, they serve on Wednesday nights in city students. Jerry plays bass. Eileen leads a small group. And Jerry said to me one day, he goes, Derek, do you understand the weight of child dedication? I go, well, tell me about it. He goes, let me tell you my story. He goes, we dedicated our daughter when she was born. We dedicated our daughter. I think we have a picture of it. He sent this to me. So that's them dedicating their daughter, Sarah. And he goes, Derek, you don't understand, like, we might not have realized the weight of that day. He goes, 18 years later, she's 18 years old, and she asks to be about a part of a leadership development program, not down the street in Brentwood, but all the way across the world in Australia, connected yeah. to a church called Hillsong. And as a parent, I mean, think about that, when your child is, is, is going to be leaving the, the home, and you're like, man, am I okay with them moving across the world for this next season? Some of you guys are like, yeah, right now I'll be willing to do that with my five-year-old, right? <laughs> but the weight of like, okay, I, I'm, like the trust that you need in that moment, right? And Jerry told me, he said, that, uh, that night they went to a concert, and at the concert the Lord gave them a vision of their child dedication. Reminded, reminded them that they dedicated their child, Sarah, to the Lord, and that the Lord was going to take care of her. And she's actually now back from that program here serving the Lord, and it's beautiful. Isn't that great? I love that. Yeah. So that's just the weight of that. I want you to understand it's, it's pretty special. If you have a child you want to dedicate to the Lord, we want to do that um, and sign up for that one as well. All right. Well, today we are continuing our series, The Way of Jesus. Uh, we've been in this journey for the last few weeks. If you're a guest with us, we've hit some pretty fun topics. Uh, we talked about being the salt and the light and what that means. We talked about divorce and anger. Lust and adultery, lying, and today we're talking about revenge. Just the easy topics in church over the last few weeks, right? So in light of that, would you please stand in the honor of the reading of God's word this morning with me? We're going to pick up Matthew chapter 5, verse 38. You have heard that it was said, eye for an eye and tooth for a tooth. But I tell you, do not resist an evil person. If someone slaps you on the right cheek... Turn to them the other cheek also. And if anyone wants to sue you and take your shirt, hand over your coat as well. If anyone forces you to go one mile, go with them two miles. Give to the one who asks you, and do not turn away from the one who wants to borrow from you. This is the word of the Lord. You may be seated. So, uh... In my family, my wife and I, we have a favorite band, and that favorite band is a band by the name of Johnny Swim. Has anybody heard of them before? 
Anybody, any fans of Johnny Swim? If you are, we could become best friends today, okay? <laughs> uh, Johnny Swim has a song that I feel like connects to the weight of somebody that's wronged us. In fact, I believe the words of this song pretty much sum up the human condition and the desire for revenge. Uh, the name of this song is called Pay Dearly. And uh, I asked the band to share this song with us today. Are you guys okay with that? Amen. Okay, so they're going to do that. You guys are wondering, why are they back up? What are we doing? Uh, I asked the band uh, to share this song with us. And, and here's why. The, the guy who helped write this, Abner, is his name in the band. He talks about um, his dad. This song is about his dad. His dad was done wrong, in Abner's words, by biblical proportions. And this is Abner's song about what happened to his dad and his desire to see revenge take place, his desire to see something happen to the person, to the people. And as you hear the words to this song, I, I just really hope, I hope that you can see where you connect with this. And we're not just going to stay there after this song. We're going to go to the words of Jesus and ask, Jesus, what do you want to speak to me today? So listen to these words. I'm not losing sleep, I'm not begging please, you won't find me weeping, oh can't you see, the seeds you sown are ripe for reaping, you picked a fight, but you got a war, like a fire needs a flood, I want you to pay dearly, for what you stole. Now you've been marked, no use in trying. It's clear to face that you've wounded grace. So stop, stop your crying. crying. Oh, can't you see? It's time you pay the price for buying. A fight you know you can't finish.
Man, isn't it, isn't it a shame we just don't have that much talent in our church, right? Are you kidding me? Give it up for them one more time, you guys. Yeah. <laughs> well, it's, there's some rough stuff in there, but I want to talk about that, John. Uh, that was an interesting moment for me because I actually asked them to do that song at 11 o'clock last night, so you guys are pretty proud of you for that one. No, I want to talk about the weight of those words. Did you guys feel it as he's sharing that? Listen to some of these lyrics. You picked a fight, but you got a war. I want you to pay dearly for what you stole from me. I want to settle the score. I want you to stop for a moment, and we're in church. And a lot of times in church, we want to look and dress and act like we got everything going on. But could it be that you walked in these doors today, and there is someone or something that has happened to you where you can actually resonate with those words, where maybe deep down, if you were honest in here, today, there is someone or something that you are struggling with, that you feel the weight, that you hope the score gets settled. You want these words. You want to get even. Not only do you want to get even, you want to see something bad happen. I want to talk about that today. Now, if you don't, if you don't believe that to be true, like maybe you don't connect with music or connect with uh, lyrics to songs, I don't know what you're doing living here, but whatever. Um, <laughs> Think about some of your favorite movies that you love. Typically in movies that we really connect with, we see like justice or we see somebody, you know, vengeance is taking place. Think about one of my favorite movies. Has anybody like Shawshank Redemption? Anybody like that one? Aren't you waiting the whole time for Andy Dufresne to get vindicated, right? Like you just want to see something bad happen to the warden. If you don't know the movie, it's a pretty tough one, but it's, it's, it's there, right? Like inside of you, you just want to see retribution, you want to see revenge, or The Count of Monte Cristo, one of my favorites, or maybe kid-friendly, Frozen, right? Don't we want to see Hans get his, right? Who is this Hans, right? You know, we just want to see him melt or something like that. Again, I think if we were to be honest in church today, which I hope we can be here, when we get wronged or when we're threatened by another person, we have a couple options that kind of bubble to the surface. And these options come to us. Maybe you studied this in 10th grade biology class like I did. There's typically two options. There's fight or flight. Flight is, is you recognize that somebody hurts you, and you might get angry about it. You might get upset about it. And instead of stepping into it, you just kind of walk away from it. But we all know this to be true. We don't really walk away from it, do we? Like somebody's hurt you, you, you know that 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 pain and that problem, that it's still there. Like it might be years later, but what happens when five to ten years later you hear that person's name again? Those emotions and that anger, maybe even that bitterness bubbles to the surface. See, to just fly away, the flight does not serve us. Well, what about fight? What if we were to step into it? You get wronged, somebody hurts you. What's the next possible act on your part. Well, you can't just, like, it can't just be, well, they, they kicked me in the shin, and so I'm going to kick them in the shin, right? We got to think, no, what is bigger and better, right? Like, if you have a sibling in the room, a brother or sister, you know this to be true, right? If your sibling bugs you, you got to go at them like 10 times worse. It reminds me of that cartoon when I was a kid. Maybe you know this one. This is going to date me a little bit. Uh, Marvin the Martian, you know Marvin the Martian and Bugs Bunny? Remember those two when they'd go at it? It would start out small, like he'd have like a bubble gun that would look like that. Couldn't do much. Then it would get a little bit bigger, right? Then it would be, you'd be a little nervous. And then what was the final move? What would Marvin the Martian want to do? Blow up the earth, right? He'd try to like destroy the earth. So when you fight, like when are you going to finally win? When the world is blown up? Like it will not, it will never end, the battle. So what do we do? Thankfully this morning, Thankfully, we have the words of Jesus to step into and to see that there's possibly a third way for us to act and to see the kingdom of God break through into our lives and into the world. Let's look at this together. Matthew chapter 5, verse 38. If you have your Bibles, you can follow along with me. You have heard that it was said, eye for an eye and tooth for a tooth. Now, let me give you a little background here. This is actually the law that Jesus is referring to, the first five books of the Bible, the Torah. And any good Hebrew would know those books. In fact, they probably had it memorized, and so they knew exactly what Jesus was referring to. Exodus 21 
says this, a life for a life, an eye for an eye, and tooth for a tooth. Leviticus 24, fracture for a fracture. Deuteronomy 19, foot for a foot. Okay? This is good. This is the, this is the court of law taking place here. This is not great parenting advice, by the way. You know, like, if you have multiple kids, I've tried it out. It doesn't work. But we know that this is in us, right? When somebody hits you, what's your natural reaction? You want to hit them back, right? What's Jesus saying, though? In this scripture, you, you got it over here, dude. Jesus is saying that this has a place in the legal system, okay? You need to understand this. This is okay. Like, it's okay, eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth, in the legal system. But when it comes to the ways of Jesus, there's a third way. There's a third way. And why is this? Because at best, you know this, violence can only keep violence in check. That's about it. And so leave that to the government, that's fine. But when it comes to following the ways of Jesus, there is another way. Look what he says in verse 39. But I tell you, do not resist an evil person. Let me try to under, help you understand that. That word resist is difficult to translate into English. The best way to say this or to understand this would be this. Do not take revenge on an evil person. Do not take revenge upon them. Do not take it into your own hands in that moment when you want to punch them back, when somebody cuts you off on the side of the road trying to merge into 31, do not take it back out on them. Do not resist an evil person. Now, the evil person, you might say, oh, who is the evil person? Well, back in that day, for a Hebrew, that would have been most likely any Roman, any Roman soldier, the government, that would have been anybody that had uh, oppression upon them. Those were the evil people in their eyes. But who is it for us today? Who are the evil people for us? This could just very simply be your mean neighbor. Your mean neighbor that's next door to you, that has a dog, that doesn't take care of you-know-what afterwards, you know? That's what that could be. I had somebody a few weeks ago tell me after service that we were talking about loving your neighbor. And he said to me, he goes to our church, he's a, he's a stakeholder, he says, Derek, you know what my neighbor did the other day? They don't like my garden, and so they threw a bunch of kitty litter into my garden to try to kill all of the plants and flowers. I was like, who does that? Are you kidding me? Like, that's crazy, right? And if that was you, we'll, we'll pray for you after service. Come on forward and we'll talk to you afterwards. I'm like, th that's the evil person in his eyes, right? Like, they did something awful there. It could be that kid at school that is bullying your child. That could be the evil person in your eyes. It could be that coworker that's bullying you. It could be the person in your life that has differing and aggressive political views. It's probably that person that when their name comes to mind, it makes your blood boil. Like your face gets red and you get a little hot as you think about them. Jesus is saying, do not take revenge on them. And then he goes on and he gives four examples of what the third way looks like. If we're not to fight, if we're not to flight against them, what do we do? Jesus gives four examples, and I want to go through these with you this morning. The first one that he says, if anyone slaps you on the right cheek, turn to them the other cheek also. If anyone slaps you on the right cheek, turn to them the other cheek also. I want you to kind of understand this a second, what this is really saying. Tom, can you come up here? I need your help this morning. Can you do that? Can you notice by his reaction he did not know this was happening? <laughs> well, you have a nice flannel on today. Isn't it good flannel weather? Yeah, looking good. I don't want you to slap me. Oh, good. But I do want you guys to see what Jesus is saying here. Because when I've read this, I've had, I've, I was confused by this. So I want you to see what's going on here. So in this culture at this time, um, most people would assume to be right-handed. So even if you were left-handed, you were kind of trained to use your right hand. And so Jesus is saying, he says, if anyone slaps you on the right cheek, turn to them the other cheek also. So Tom, are you left-handed or right-handed? Oh, my goodness. Out of everybody? All right, pretend you're right-handed because that's what okay. we're going to assume. What are the chances of that one? So if you were right-handed and, and you're going to slap me on my right cheek, I'm going to go like this when you slap me, how would most people do that? Let me just see. How would you do that with your right hand? Right hand on the right cheek. Yeah. Backhand. backhand. Yeah. You would go backhand. You got it. And then I go, boom, right. Okay, so what I want you to understand there 
he's probably not going to get a ton of force with that hit, right? Did you know that that is less about the pain and more about the shame? That is less about the pain and more about the shame. And remember, we're talking about an honor and shame culture. Tom would be shaming me in that moment. I would be shamed. And, and it's not just me. It would probably be shaming my family as well. Okay? So that's a big deal. And what does Jesus say when that happens to you? Have you ever had somebody shame you? Like maybe even it, you, weren't, you, didn't, you didn't even deserve it. What does Jesus say? He says, turn to them the other cheek also. So now if Tom is still there and he's still pretend right-handed. So I'm gonna, I just got hit this way. I'm going to go this way now. You're going to hit me right here. How would you normally do that? Would you slap or would you just go for a straight, you know, Ivan Drago? You'd probably go Ivan Drago on me, wouldn't you? Rocky IV. And we all know, I think it was, which one was it where Apollo dies? You could kill me, dude. Okay, okay, good, good. That's why I chose you. I was just nervous there. Okay, left-handed you could, though. Oh, yeah. Okay, so think about this for a second. Oh, ho, ho. those are fighting words. I'll see oh. you in the parking lot after church. <laughs> so think about this. Jesus is saying, if somebody shames you, give them a moment to punch you in the face. Why would he say that? Because if Tom does that, if Tom chooses to punch me for no reason whatsoever, even though I just turned this way to receive it, that could bring shame on Tom, and not only Tom, but Tom's family. Tom, in this moment, I become a human to him. Tom, in this moment, has to decide, is this dude worth knocking his lights out? Tom, in this moment, has to decide, is it, is it worth bringing shame upon me and my family to do this right now? You know what this does to Tom? This makes Tom check out what's going on in here. What's going on in my heart to where I would slap this guy? Is it, is it, is it worth it to me to punch him in the face too? This is the third way. Does that make sense? Let's give it up for Tom and his flannel and his left hand. And I'm just kidding. I really don't want to see you in the parking lot afterwards unless we're going to Don Arturo's, okay? All right. So I, I want to make sure you understand something with this because this scripture can be used to allow abuse. Some people have done this. I know, it sounds crazy, right? They've used scripture to make like, their case bigger than what Jesus was actually trying to say. Let me make sure you understand this. Jesus does not mean that if someone hits us across the right side of our head with a baseball bat, that we should allow them to hit the left side also. Do you hear me on that? This is less about physical, okay? This is not about like getting, like you actually, in that moment, I, I would tell you to seek help in that moment if it's physical. This is an honor-shame thing and really helping check this person's heart. It's like if somebody dumps kitty litter all over your lawn. <laughs> you go over there and you cut their grass instead. That's more of what we're saying right now, okay? Wow, they're cutting my grass. Maybe I shouldn't have done that. All right, that's the first one. Want to make sure you understand that. The second one, verse 40, has to do with shirts. And if anyone wants to sue you and take your shirt, hand over your coat as well. So let me kind of play this out for you. You're getting sued. And they're not just going after your entire bank account. They're not just going after your home. They're actually going after the shirt off your own back. What kind of person does that? Somebody that's just, man, there might be something going on in their heart, right? And so Jesus says, instead of getting upset, instead of fighting back at them and lighting their house on fire or doing something crazy to them, Instead of running away to the, uh, another town, what does Jesus say the third way is? Take off your coat as well and give it to them. Did you know that under Hebrew law, you could not take someone's outer garment? Did you know that? It's like you could sue them for everything, even that last shirt, but you could not take their outer, gar outer garment. Did you know why? Because that was also their blanket. You can't take that from somebody. And so Jesus is saying, if somebody's willing to take every single piece of clothing from you, why not just offer them your last bit of clothing, which we all know what that would leave the individual, in the court of law, give that over to them as well. You think in that moment they're probably asking themselves, man, is there something going on in my heart? Am I this greedy? Am I, am I willing to be this oppressive? Jesus is challenging us to look at the third way, to help people check their own hearts and maybe get a little crazy in the process. It's actually... Some scholars would read this as quite humorous, that Jesus is saying, you're taking off all your garments in court, 
and people might be laughing in that moment. But he, Jesus is saying, go for it. You might expose that person's greed and their oppression. It might change their hearts in the process. I think of it kind of like this. When I, um, when I make a mistake on the road, sometimes I drive and I forget what's going on around me and I might cut somebody off. I apologize if I've done that to you. Um, a lot of people, when that happens, they, um, they wave at me with one finger. You guys know what I'm talking about. I've, I've talked about that before. It happens a lot on 31. And instead of, like, um, doing that back to them, um, I find myself just waving at them like this. And I'm like, oh, man, why are they so happy? Like, I'm hoping that they're like, why did I just wave at them with one finger? You know, it's just driving down the road. It causes them to, like, think, what's going on? If I've done that to you, I apologize for cutting you off, and I really am just truly excited about life, okay? But that's what that does, right? Does that make sense? It causes somebody to think about, man, where's my heart at this morning? Where's my heart at this afternoon? All right, number three. Verse 41, if anyone forces you to go one mile, go with them two miles. Uh, under Roman law at the time, a Roman soldier, you know what they could do? They could ask anybody in their area, any, any Hebrew in the area, they could say, hey, I want you to carry my stuff for up to one mile. That was Roman law. They could ask, they could ask you to carry about 60 or 70 pounds of gear for up to a mile. Are you kidding me right there? Think about how oppressive that feels. Hey, take my stuff. It's sweaty. It stinks. And I want you to carry it for an entire mile. That's probably what Jesus is referring to right here. And what does Jesus say? You could fight him. And if you're going to fight a Roman soldier, you'll probably die. You could, you could flight. You could run away from them. And it depends on how fast you are. If you got your Nikes on, maybe you'll make it. But you probably won't. They got another buddy down the street that will probably take your life. Or what about this? What if instead of just you go that one mile, at the one mile mark, you hold on to that 70 pounds a year and you go two miles? What do you think happens in the mind of the Roman soldier at that point? What, is this guy crazy? What, what about this? What if in that moment you start talking to them? Hey, so how did you get into the military? Was that your choice? Like what happened there? What if you start asking them about their family? Hey, do you, do you miss your family? Do you have kids? Do you miss them? You excited to go back? What if you just started to make that person human in that moment? What would happen to their heart? Go the extra mile. What does that look like in our life? What does that, students in the room, what does that look like at school? You got somebody that's just getting under your skin. It makes your blood boil. What does it look like to go the extra mile for them? At some point, they're going to have to check their own heart and ask, do I want what that person has? What they have is so good they're willing to go two miles? Are you kidding me? It's beautiful. Verse 42. Give to the one who asks you, and do not turn away from the one who wants to borrow from you. There's a shift that takes place in this one. See, the first three, Jesus is actually referring to the oppressed. Okay, he's talking to those that are being asked to go the extra mile, those that are being sued, those that have just gotten slapped. In this moment, he's actually speaking to the oppressor, the one that has all the power and probably most likely all the money. So let me just remind you in this room today, Jesus, guess what? He's on the side of the oppressed. Did you know that? If you look through the scripture, those that have been hurt, those that have had struggles in life, he's on their side. But guess what? He's also on the side of the oppressor. He's drawing them back to him and to grace and to love and to mercy and a better way of living with the resources that they have. So I don't know where you're at today. Maybe you have a lot to offer. Jesus right here is speaking to you. He's saying, hey, look, if anyone asks you, give to them. But look what he says, and do not turn away from the one who wants to borrow from you. Isn't it interesting that he says, do not turn away? I think what he's getting at here is it's not just about giving the money. Did you know it's not usually about just giving the money? It's usually about our hearts. You see, we can give stuff away. We can give resources away. We can give finances away. But did you know Jesus cares deeply about what's going on in your heart? That's what he cares about. And he's asking you, when you give to somebody, would you make a heart connection with them? Would you walk with them in it? If you're going to provide for them, if you're going to bless someone, would you, would you journey with them? Maybe the biggest thing that needs to happen in their life is that you pray with them in the journey. This isn't just about giving away 
resources. Now, I, I want to make sure we understand there is a level of personal responsibility that needs to take place because giving to others can actually turn into enabling. Did you know that? Giving to others can actually turn into enabling, and it can actually become a thing where you become, they become codependent, you become codependent. It can actually be dangerous for the relationship. That's why I encourage you to pray about anything that the Lord might ask you to lean into when it comes to generosity. It might mean this, you guys. You know what this might mean? Somebody asks you for money. It might mean that you do provide something, but it also might mean that you say, hey, I want to journey this with you. I have a, a tool that I want to teach you and share with you. It's a little thing called Financial Peace University. Can I teach you a little bit about this thing? You guys know what I'm talking about? Like you walk them through that. Help them see that there's opportunity to honor the Lord in this area of their life. I think about my grandpa. My grandpa Sturk, I've shared stories with you about him. My grandpa is, um, he's a great man. He loves Jesus deeply. There was a season in his life where he uh, he owned 30, almost 30 homes in the Grand Rapids, Michigan area. It was uh, uh, low-income housing, uh, HUD housing, if you're familiar with that phrase. And so he cared for these individuals and these families that lived in these homes. You know what I loved about my grandpa? If anybody called him, at all hours of the day, he was willing to take that call and serve them in that moment. If somebody was late with rent, he was willing to walk them through. He didn't send them an eviction notice on day two. He walked them through. Now, at some point, there was responsibility. If at some level you weren't going to take it on yourself, then there was a decision that had to be made. But I watched him. I used to work, those, I used to work the lawns with him, like cut the grass, did nothing with kitty litter in that moment. And I would work that, and I would watch my grandpa interact with the individuals and families. He loved them so much. He'd play with the kids. He'd bring treats. They loved it when Grandpa came. <laughs> it wasn't this oppressor, you know, coming, I'm scared that the landlord came. I need to make sure the gate's fixed and all that stuff. He loved them well. And I do believe, you guys, I believe that what Jesus is saying here is that this is actually the good life. When you live a generous life, when you give of yourself to others, when you don't just give stuff away, but you give your life away in the process, that is tasting the good life. That is the third way of living. It's beautiful, isn't it? That's the way to go. So here's my challenge for us this morning. What does the third way look like in our lives today, 2018? What does it look like to live this out? It's a little different context. I want to bring you to Romans chapter 12. Beautiful chapter in the Bible, starting in verse 17. We get an idea of how we are to respond in life. The writer Paul says this, Do not repay anyone evil for evil. He's kind of connecting to what Jesus says. Be careful to do what is right in the eyes of everyone. And if it is possible, look at these seven words right here. This, this is key for us. As far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. As far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. See, there's a reality that for some people in your life who have wronged you, who have hurt you, maybe are struggling and they keep coming to you and asking you for things, at some level there might be people in your life that don't want to move forward. What do we do with them? They don't want to move forward. They don't want to own their stuff. Can I just remind you, church, if... You're in this room. I don't even care if, if you're a follower of Jesus, and you might not be a follower of Jesus. I'm most, this is most likely true of you. You can only control yourself. And remember, that's on a good day, right? We can only control ourselves, and that's most likely on a good day. At some level, at some point, people have to take personal responsibility. Here's my encouragement to you. Ask God, God, what are you saying to me in this situation right here? What do I need to own? What is it that depends on me? Do I need to step into this? As far as it depends on me, what is it? What is it, God, that you are trying to teach me? There might be some awful people in your life that have hurt you so badly, so badly. Like, you have it. You have that history. But in that moment, what if you just ask, God, what do you want to teach me? I have somebody in my life I think of as I read this. They lied to me. And I still think about it. And I can get angry about it. I can, get, I can get angry to the point where I can get bitter and I can get incredible Hulk mode, you know what I'm saying? And I'm not talking green. 
What I've been learning to ask, I, I, I've shared this with you in full disclosure of my life, I go to a counselor, and he said this to me. He said, Derek, anger is not bad. Anger is a fine emotion. Jesus got angry, right? We talked about that a few weeks ago. That's okay. But are you letting it turn into rage? Are you letting it turn into bitterness? In this moment, why don't you ask God, God, what do you want to teach me? I literally just had this conversation after the last service. God was trying to teach someone something about the relationships in their life. God, what do you want to teach me in this moment? As far as it depends on you. Paul goes on, do not take revenge, my dear friends, but leave room for God's wrath, for it is written, it is mine to avenge and I will repay, says the Lord. On the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him something to drink. In doing this, you will heap burning coals on his head. We're going to save that one for another week's message. That's, an, that's what we call an idiom. That's not actual like burning coals on their head. So please don't do that after service. Tom, don't do that to me in the parking lot after service. But what does this scripture say right here? Oh, there, there will be. There will be judgment. The Lord's got that. Like, we're afraid of these words in church, wrath and judgment, but that's going to take place, and that's the Lord's to do. What is ours? What's our part in this? You know what our part is? It's to serve, it's to love, and it's to live generously, trusting that the Lord's got this. Anytime we want to step into the judgment mode, into the revenge mode, we're taking on God's job in that moment. Verse 21, I just love how... He ends this, do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. I want to invite the worship host to, to get up and to begin to distribute the, the communion elements. And if you're not at a place to receive communion this morning, you can just let the tray pass you by. But if you are, I'd like to ask you to grab the, the cup. The bread is below the juice. Paul is saying, do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Why would he say this? I think he says this because this is the way of Jesus. This is exactly what Jesus did. What did Jesus say to us? He said to his followers, take up your cross and follow me. Take up your cross and follow me. He didn't say take up your sword and take out everybody around you. He said take up your cross and follow me. When they hurled insults at him, when they spat on him, when they placed the crown of thorns on his head, he did not fight back. I love the words of Dietrich Bonhoeffer as we think about this. And it, before they come up on the screen, just a life, if you want to try to understand what to do towards your enemies, read his biography. Crazy story during World War II. But Dietrich said this, evil will become powerless when it finds no opposing object. Are we willing as a people to fight for the third way? It's interesting. Um, yesterday, I got a text from a guy in our church. He, he played in the band earlier, and he got the notes on the songs we were going to do and he saw that Pay Dearly was going to be one of the songs. And he goes, Derek, he texts, he goes, Derek, do you understand the meaning of that song? And I said, yeah, kind of. He goes, can I give you the full story? I said, yeah, tell me. He goes, um, Abner, the guy who, who wrote that, his dad uh, was a pastor in Cuba. And when, there's a moment when the borders were open to allow Cubans to come into the country. And I don't know everything going on there, but, but his dad took that as an opportunity. Well, along with that, he made it in, which is great. But along with that, Cuba also sent a list to the U.S. that said, these are all the fugitives that have entered your countries, just so you know. And Abner's dad was on that list. And so he spent many years in prison because of that, wrongfully accused, wrongfully accused. And so Abner actually says that song for him is like three minutes and 33 seconds of being able to step into the anger and upsetness. But he does say this about the story, which is so beautiful, that his dad on his deathbed 
had forgiven every single one of them that had wronged him. His dad died free. His dad had a relationship with Jesus. And so if you are in this room today and you've been wronged, you've been hurt, may we look to the cross to be reminded of what Jesus has done for us. At some point over the next, we're going to do this soon. I want to get a cross in our building because I'm sick of having to do this without having a visual of the cross. But you know what they look like. I want you to think about it. There's the vertical. You've got the vertical part of the cross. You know what this meal represents? This meal represents our connection to our Father, what Jesus has done for us. We have a vertical connection to our Father through Jesus Christ. His body was broken and his blood was shed. And because of that, you know what that gives us access to? Horizontal reconciliation. That horizontal bar represents the reconciliation to all those around us. You might even be in church today and somebody's wronged you in this building. I'm sorry for that. I'm sorry. Here is the beauty, though. We come together for this meal. Much like my family, when there's tension and the kids maybe fought, we sit down and we pray and we say, thank you, Jesus, for this meal. That's what we're doing right now. We're having a horizontal reconciliation meal. We're reminded of what Jesus has done vertically and horizontally. We forgive others. That's what Abner's dad did. That's what we're called to as followers of Jesus. And and if anything else, let me just remind you of this before we take this meal. You can only control yourself and your response to that truth. Nobody else can make that decision to follow Jesus for you. So maybe you're here today and you've never received Jesus as your Lord and Savior. You can find your hope and truth in him. Just say, Lord, I I believe in you. I believe in your son, Jesus. I receive him as my Lord and my Savior. You can say that right there where you're at right now. You don't even need to close your eyes. And you can take this meal knowing that Jesus has paid the price for you. Why don't you take the bread? you'll look at it. This bread, Jesus tells us, represents his body that was broken for you, that was broken for me, because he's madly in love with us. Let's take and eat together. Jesus tells us that this cup right here It's not just juice. Jesus tells us that this cup represents his blood. Shed for you and shed for me, a vertical reconciliation took place between us and the Father through that sacrifice. Let's take and drink. Amen. Would you please stand where you're at? couple of things before you leave here today. One, if you need prayer, maybe this message and this topic for you brings up a lot of emotion, a thought. We would love to pray with you. There's a prayer room uh, out to the left after the service. And if there's something that you have a question on, I'll be hanging out down front uh, when it comes to this topic. And then also, I would encourage you to be back next week as we continue the topic of loving our enemies. So be back uh, for that. I'm going to give you a prayer of blessing before you leave here today. May you live in the grace found through Jesus Christ, vertically reconciled to the Father. And because of that, may you live out that grace to all those you come in contact with. May your heart be soft to the Spirit's leading. And as you do, may people be drawn to Jesus. In Jesus' name, amen. Grace and peace. Love you guys.